Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you here. We're just having a good time, and if you're not here, um, you're missing out on some goodies um, that we've been munching on, and, and we're just sitting here fellowshipping and enjoying the food, and I just realized what time it is. It's after 7, so, um, yeah. We're, uh, we're happy that you could join us online, and hope you'll be able to come join us in person soon. I have several announcements. I'll, I'll mention them again, but I want to mention from at the, at the top here so the people online can hear. Um, tomorrow begins, or midnight begins our 24 hours of prayer. So if you have a time slot, be sure to jump in there, call the next person, remind them. Um, if you don't have a time slot and you'd like one, see Lisa Talley. She can set you up with a time slot. And if... Uh, you know, if all else uh, fails, just pick one out and, and join join in the prayer time. We try to take our long uh, prayer prayer slots. Uh, that is tomorrow. The fundraiser for Candace Fry is Friday from 11 to 2 at Norton Farms, uh, which is on Green Street at the corner of US 220. And um, that's going to be from 11 to 2. The plates are $10 for a barbecue plate with all the trimmings. Uh, dessert as well. If you have made desserts for that to donate to that, uh, if you can get those to us by noon tomorrow, the latest. We've got a bunch in tonight, but by noon tomorrow at the latest. Um, senior adult Christmas party is Monday at 6 o'clock. If you have not signed up for that, be sure to uh, contact the church office. Make sure you're signed up. And next Wednesday night is the school programs. And so that'll be uh, 6 for the younger children and at 7 for the older kids. So the younger ones, the 18-month to 3-year-olds will be at 6 o'clock. And at 7 o'clock, we'll have the 4-year-olds, kindergarten and first grade. And that'll be in the sanctuary. Everyone's welcome to come, but we won't have any other services next. Wednesday night. We will not have Bible study uh, during that time. And I hope you'll be able to come out and support and encourage our children. And I suggest you come early uh, to get a seat. Also, we are having Christmas Eve service at 6 o'clock. Um, and then it'll be about a 40, 45 minute at the most service. Very meaningful, very uh, spiritual Time to gather together to, to worship uh, on Christmas Eve. I, you know, bring if you've got company, bring them with you. We we really want to have everybody here uh, to be a part of that. It's such a wonderful, wonderful time together. Also, on Christmas Day, we're going to have worship at 10 a.m. No Sunday school. Christmas Day worship at 10 a.m. No Sunday school. So, please come out for that. We won't keep you here. We won't even keep you here a whole hour. You should be able to be home in an hour. So come out, um, take a break from whatever you do Christmas Day morning, and, and spend it in the house of the Lord, worshiping Him. Now, one other thing I need to mention. We need some help with the fundraiser um, for Friday. Specifically, we need four more men who are willing to help at 5 o'clock tomorrow to put meat on the grill. Shouldn't take more than an hour, hour and a half. Over at the Millstone Community Building. That's on Gibson Nursery Road, is that right? Uh, the Millstone Community Building tomorrow at 5 p.m. Friday morning, we need about 10 guys to come and pull meat off the grill and help to pick it and get it, get it ready to go. Um, we desperately need that help. So please let me know tonight if you plan on helping with either tomorrow night or Friday morning. Also, um, we're going to need delivery drivers. We're going to need people to um, just be there and greet the guests who come to buy a plate and that sort of thing. Uh, 11 to 2 at Norton Farms. Uh, we appreciate all the help we can get. We want to get Candace over the hump to get her Get her wheelchair so she can, Mama says, so she can wash dishes. Get her to stand up and wash some dishes. Um. <laughs> so 
So um, that's Thursday and Friday. Please let me know tonight uh, about your availability to help with that. Also, if you have large orders, if you have a big group that, you know, whether it's a workplace or, you know, some group that you're going to uh, order for or that you know of that would like a large order, let us know about that so we'll make sure we have all that prepared. All right, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to begin. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I had that on my mind, but I didn't write it down. Okay, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock at Cole Auditorium, there is going to be a gospel singing, and our very own Logan is going to be singing with one of the groups. Um I have 13 tickets that are free. I just need to know if you'd like to go. They're, they're already paid for. If you'd like to, to go, let me know tonight, and we'll get you a ticket for the concert tomorrow night. There's three groups. Tell us who they are, Logan. Glory Bound, Cameronian, Eastern Sunrise. If you want a ticket and you're not here tonight, too bad. Um, no. um, send Bob a message. He's back there, him and Mitch. And one of them, uh, one of them will let me know if we have somebody that wants a ticket that's watching online. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for reminding me of that, Ken. Father, we, we do thank you for this day, for your love. We thank you for allowing us to come together to study your, your word together our brothers and sisters in Christ that we can fellowship with for food and, 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 and good coffee and, and tea and an opportunity to laugh and, and, and have a, a great time together in your house. Now, Lord, as we focus on your word in the 119th Psalm, we just pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would teach us what it is you want us to learn from this passage tonight and that we would apply it to our lives daily. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, we are looking at Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40 tonight. Verses 33 through 40. And as we've talked about before, this psalm is an acrostic uh, poem using the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 stanzas, and each stanza has eight verses. Tonight, we're looking at the fifth stanza, and it's headed with the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, this is an easy one. What's it say? P. P. That's um, not my best Hebrew voice, but that's what we say, right? He. That's the fifth letter of the um, Hebrew alphabet. And this section reminds us of the importance of being good students of God's Word. So we'll see at least three things that we need to do as we study God's Word. This is very appropriate for us because... Um, not only do we study God's Word here on Wednesday nights, but we study God's Word in Sunday school, Sunday mornings, during worship, but also hopefully every day at home, each of us are studying God's Word. Verses 33 through 40. I want to read verses 33 through 35, first of all. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. And as I've mentioned before, that word statutes and, and at least one word in 170 out of 175 or 171 out of 176 of the verses mention God's word. And that word statutes here is a mention of God's word. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Another word for God's word. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments. Another synonym for God's word. For I delight in it. So 
So the first step in studying God's Word is to pray for illumination. To pray to God to open the Word to us, to just shine a light on it and help us understand it. Um, illumination, as you know, is the, the process of, of shining light on something that's not visible and making it visible, making it understandable. God wants us to understand His Word. Sadly, that's one of the biggest complaints I hear about God's Word is I don't understand what I'm reading. And usually that's when I ask, did you pray for understanding before you read the Word? That's important. Pray for illumination. Um, you know, Christians all over the world start schools. Education has always been important to Christians. Um, the missionaries, there are many missionaries who've given their lives to translate the scriptures into language for students who had no exposure to the scriptures. So they could read it in their own language and understand it. Um, the very first universities in the United States were for training ministers. They were schools for learning and studying God's Word. Sadly, a lot of those universities still exist, but they don't focus much on God's Word anymore. A lot of them have lost their foundation. So, you know, when... Um, when someone goes to goes off to college, goes off to a university, they're usually asked, why do you want to attend this school? Why do you want to come here? And in these verses, the psalmist tells us why he wants to learn God's Word, why he wants to understand God's Word. According to verse 34, why does the psalmist want to know God's Word? So he can understand it and obey it. Yeah, he uses both of those. Um, he wants to understand and keep God's word. And he wants to obey it, observe it with his whole heart. Now, because of our fallen nature, we really don't need anybody to teach us how to sin, do we? Have you ever had to teach your children to disobey? You don't have to teach that, do you? That's just our nature, our fallen nature. But we do need instruction in living righteously. We do need instruction to know what we ought to do. And that's where the Word of God comes in. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, we're reminded that there is no one righteous, not even one. Not one. Now this doesn't mean that there are no decent people on the earth. There are a lot of decent people. But what it means is that we all tend to sin. We all navigate towards sin. Naturally. And that's because at our core, we're selfish. Really. We want I mean, that's all you got to say, right? We want. <laughs> and, and, and that's what, if you think about it, you know, what causes me to sin? What causes me to disobey? Because I want, fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. The psalmist understands this. And he wants God to teach him through the word how to live righteously. So he asked God to illuminate his mind so he can clearly see God's statutes, God's law. 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about God's word. Somebody read that for us. 2 Timothy 3.16. You might know it by heart. Okay. 
four things all Scripture is good for. What are they? You just read them. Read them again, Jay. <laughs> Doctrine. Correction. Instruction in righteousness. So doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. These are all things that, you know, this, this pretty well covers it. If you want to live righteously, right? If you want to live to serve God. Now, one of the lies that Satan uses most often is that God's way is no fun. You ever heard anybody say that? Why do I want to be a Christian? Christians don't have any fun. You know, we had a we had a group that went to Calabash a couple of weeks ago, had a lot of fun. Um, we have fun here. We have fun on Sundays. We have fun when we have our class socials. I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had. God is not boring. And God's people are anything but boring. But Satan wants to convince us that if we try to live according to God's word, we'll become dull. We'll be bored. Life will not be fun. But the psalmist here in verse 35 gives us a different view of righteous living. The Bible is our source of what? Look at verse 35. Delight. Delight. The Bible is the source of our deepest delight for God's people. So, you know, there's a lot of temporary fun that can be had. And sin is what we give into. And if it wasn't fun, nobody would do it, right? People wouldn't sin if it wasn't fun. But they do. We all do. But that short-lived fun... It gives birth to long-range trouble. It gives birth to regret. You know, Moses could have lived as a prince in Egypt. But in Hebrews 11.25, hear what, well, somebody tell me what, what, he, what he chose instead. Hebrews 11, verse 25. Somebody read that. Just one at a time, please. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 25. Hmm. He chose to suffer with God's people rather than the pleasure of sin for a season. Moses, he, um, he became pretty famous because he chose the right thing, the right way to live. Psalm 1611 gives us an eternal perspective that that really Satan wants us to forget. Psalm 16.11 says, You'll show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. At our right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So when we have the fullness of joy, because we've trusted Christ, follow God, we will have the kind of joy the kind of pleasures that, that don't fade away. They're eternal. So, if we would be a good student of God's word, 
we would pray for illumination. That should be the first step before we read God's Word. The second thing that we would do would be to avoid temporary preoccup preoccupation. I can't say it. Preoccupations. We see this in verses 36 and 37. Incline my ear to your testimonies. Another synonym for the word of God. And not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Again, a synonym there for the for scripture. There are two kinds of preoccupation that the psalmist warns us to avoid here. The first one is preoccupation with covetousness. He says, incline my heart to your testimonies, not to covetousness. The Hebrew word that's translated here is covetousness, means to plunder. It's the word used in 1 Samuel chapter 8 to describe the, the corruption among Samuel's sons. The truth is, we've talked about this many times, but everything belongs to God. It's His. We're the short-term stewards of everything He gives us. We should invest His resources wisely. We should invest in things that pay eternal dividends. You know, if, if, if you had a big chunk of money that you needed to invest into some account, and you went to a, a broker, and you said, you know, I really want something that's going to give me the best returns. Most of the time, they're going to point you toward long-term investments. They're going to point you towards something that, that has a history of steady growth. And there's, sadly, you know, when it comes to that kind of investment, there's no, no guarantees. But with God, there are. When we invest in eternal things, like the salvation of souls, that's something we never regret. If we help just one person come to know the Lord, they spend eternity in heaven because we invested, whether it was our time or we invested our, our money, but we invested in them. Our prayers. We have to remember that faithful stewardship demonstrates our love for God. We can tell God we love Him, but when we are faithful in our giving, and I'm not just talking about money, but whatever we, we're giving, then we're showing God that we love Him. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. And then he made one more statement in that verse. Do you know what it was? Do you remember? You cannot Matthew six twenty four, you cannot serve God and mammon or money stuff. So you're either going to be faithful to God or you're going to be faithful to stuff. The word that he uses there in um, Matthew 6, 24 that is translated as serve means to be enslaved to. And in a sense, those of us who have a relationship with Christ, we become as slaves to him. Those who don't, are usually enslaved by something else, whether it's money, a job, or, or, or a person, or a place, or, a, or land, or whatever it may be. 
athletics. It can be a lot of different things. But the modern form of, of slavery, I think you, you know, it's best seen in those who, who, who will borrow money for things they don't need that they can't pay back. And we see that. We've all seen it. We've seen it in our families, maybe in your own lives. But stuff that quickly loses its value. Um, you know, people say, well, you, you, you buy a, an automobile and you know, a new automobile and you drive it off the lot, it depreciates in value, right? You know, everything in this world that is temporary is a huge depreciation if we invest in the wrong kind of things. We need to invest in eternal things. So, we need to be careful to avoid preoccupation with covetousness. Another, one author said, is a preoccupation with depreciating doodads. Okay, here's what, here's what the author says. Depreciation is a loss of value and a doodad is an unnecessary or vain thing. And we've all been guilty, haven't we? How many times have we, you know, eagerly spent money on something that we were so excited to get and almost immediately regretted. But why in the world did I invest in that? So, anything that we acquire, the author says that's not of God, we could consider a doodad. All right? And King Solomon talked about this. In the book of Ecclesiastes. After he had. Gotten everything he wanted. Married all the women he wanted. Had all the money. Knowledge. Castles. All the excesses. That. King could have. This man the wisest. Person in the world according. To most. Philosophers, at least other than Jesus. He came to a conclusion. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, we see what he decided. Somebody look at that. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Ecclesiastes 12, chapter 12, verse, verse 13. We'll see what, what Solomon decided. Remember, he had everything. Wow. This is the conclusion after he had everything including all the wisdom, or more wisdom than anyone else. He concluded that what was most important was to fear God and keep His commandments. He said, this, this is everything that we owe God. This is everything to man. So if we would be a good student of God's Word, we will pray for illumination. We want to know eternal truth. And we would avoid temporary preoccupations with selfish gain and depreciating doodads. But finally, if we would be a good student of God's word, we would have the right aspiration. The right aspiration, we see this in verses 38 through 40. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long 
for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. The psalmist is facing severe opposition from the world. And he says, establish your word in me. Set it firm in my heart so that I can recall it in times of need. He's not talking about a specific promise. He's talking about the whole counsel of God's word. All of it. Some of it's easier to, to follow than, than some of it. Some of the other things we find in God's word. But as we focus on his word. God will confirm his promises to us. He will keep his promises to us. So it's important for us to increase in our understanding of God's word. And that requires more than just a casual reading. It requires proper preparation through prayer and it requires our, our devoted thoughts and, and, and focused attention on what God is saying through his word. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was tempted by Satan. And each time that he was tempted, what did he do? He quoted God's word. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who could have, who could have, you know, zapped Satan right there. He instead chose to quote God's word. That's how important his word is to Christ. And if it's that important that he would rely on on God's word to defend himself against Satan, then don't you think you and I can count on it to defend us as well? Satan knew that Jesus was hungry and he dared Jesus to turn some stones into bread. And so Jesus Quoted Deuteronomy 8.3, at least part of that verse. What did he say? It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And here in verse 38, the psalmist says that when God confirms his promises, we'll fear him. Now, and this is not talking about fear in the sense that we're afraid of God, that we're constantly hiding and running from him. It means that we have the utmost respect for him. We do fear his judgment when we fail. We fear his judgment on those who reject him. But we fear him with awesome reverence and respect. Why is this true? Think about the first chapter of the Revelation. The Apostle John gives us a personal encounter with resurrected King Jesus. And his coming to judge the world. So somebody read Revelation 1. Verse 17. Let's see John's reaction to the awesome coming of, of Christ the King. It says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, 
Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. John's reaction, his response to Christ, the king, he fell at his feet as if he were dead. I mean, that, that's pretty powerful. If we think about it. Here was a man who had been exiled for preaching the gospel, for serving the Lord. And God gave him a glimpse of the future. God gave him a glimpse of what eternity was going to look like. And it, it, it struck him with fear. But Christ said to him, Fear not, I am the first and the last. What's the significance of being first and last? Yeah. Yeah. He's there. And, and he's there all you know, those are the bookends, the beginning and the end. And he's there throughout the whole story. The Word is Christ. John said in his gospel that the, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, Christ is the Word. And He is the first and the last. And what better pursuit could we have than to know him and understand his word to love and be able to to share his word you know if if we didn't have a personal relationship with god and 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 maybe somebody who's watching or maybe somebody in this room doesn't have a personal relationship with god it should absolutely terrify you Think about the end of time. It should absolutely terrify you to think of God's coming judgment. But if you've trusted Christ, maybe literally, but at least figuratively, you've fallen at His feet out of fear and respect. You've trusted Him as Savior, and you don't have to be afraid anymore. He was there at the beginning. He'll be there at the end. He was there at the beginning of your journey with Him, your relationship with Him, and He'll be there with you through it all. So we can live without fear of the judgment. We can live with the promise of Hebrews 4.16. It says, let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, I like, it, it means a lot to me that my kids can come to me boldly. Say, Dad, I've got this problem, or I need help with this. You know, it's the kids that, that fear their parents so much that they can't even come to them tentatively and, and say, you know, I, I really need something here. I really need some advice or some help. I'm, I'm kind of scared to ask those. I think that's sad. Um, God wants us to know that we can approach him boldly if we're his child. We can come to him and say, Dad, here's what's going on in my life. I know you know, but I'm asking you to help me with it. I'm asking you to, to walk me through it. to Give me strength for it. To make a difference. To use me as I go through it. Any other thoughts about these verses tonight? Listen, you know, fighting dogs and all that. Well, I think one reason people 
are selfish with their money is because they don't have faith that God will provide for them. Right. But I happen to know someone who didn't have much money, was newly divorced from a bad relationship, who gave everything she had to everybody around her. Well, one day she came into $10,000, invested in real estate, and it flopped it big time. Mm-hmm. And she's continued to bless other people, and it, there's, you know, has no doubt that God will provide. So I think that I think it takes faith to do that. Yeah, it does for us individually, even as a church, to trust that God is going to provide if we are good stewards of what He gives us. And, and that means not hoarding, but, but investing wisely in lives to see lives changed. That's, that's what ministry is. When we come to the throne of God, we do so with confidence because He loves us, because He's made promises to us to get us through whatever our needs may be. Um... Yeah. Saying that he's going to hear you, and you know, hopefully, I mean, you want to think that he's going to answer your prayer, but we also got to remember, I mean, he's going to do his will, mm-hmm. and we want his will, but still, you got to be confident when you pray and believe that it's just going to be presented to you through faith. You know, there's always a chance that that we're going to backslide. We're going to mess up. We're never going to, even as as dedicated students, we're going to fail. There are going to be times that we don't choose the right things. But we need to remember that the Lord is going to provide. He is going to hear our prayers. He promises that if we confess our sins and, re- and repent, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, verse 39 says, Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. You are a good and righteous judge, in other words. Um, so being friends with Jesus is going to make us an enemy with the world. It's just a natural thing that's going to happen. We're going to face scorn. But Jesus promises that even though we will be treated the way he was treated by the world, that he is going to be there for us. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Basically, if you want to personalize it, if I desire to live a a righteous life, a godly life in Christ Jesus, I will suffer persecution. Not I might, but I will. Verse 40. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. So whatever whatever we're doing, wherever we're going in this world, if we listen carefully, we'll know that just about everyone around us is asking what in the world has happened? What has happened to the world we live in? We hear it daily. I do. I I wish I could go back to the world I grew up in. What has happened to society? And I think if we're sensitive to individuals, we'll hear people say, whether they actually use the words or not, what's happened to me? What's happened to me? The psalmist gives us some answers. We live in a world where people are spiritually dead. People are separated from God. 
and we long for truth. We long for purpose in life. You know, Rick Warren, you know, he wrote the book The Purpose Driven Life and you know, really became a huge hit. When we trust Jesus, he bridges that, that gap for us. He helps us to see the light of God's truth. Even in a world of darkness. And if we walk in that light. We can fight a good fight. The psalmist in Psalm 116. In verse 8. Just a few words from a prayer. You have delivered my soul from death. My eyes from tears, my feet from falling. If we want to be a student of God's word, pray for illumination, avoid temporary preoccupations, and have the right aspiration. Seek to live a life that pleases God. And that's you know, that, that should be every Christian's desire. To not just know him, but to please him. And, you know, the word tells us he's not pleased with our sacrifices. What he wants is our obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. Any final thoughts? Well, we'll say goodbye to those who've joined us online as we come together for a time of prayer tonight. If you have a prayer need, let us know what we can do for you. Don't forget the um, fundraiser Friday, 11 to 2 at Norton Farms. Come out and, and support Candace Fry. Um, also, uh, the 24 hours of prayer begins at midnight tonight. Uh, we're having a senior adult Christmas party on the 6th. I mean, I'm sorry, on the 5th. Um, next Wednesday night, we will not be meeting, but we will have our school programs. If you can't be here in per person, I'm sure you'll be able to watch them online. They will be streamed. Is that true, Mitch? All right. So you can watch it online next Wednesday night if you can't be here. Also, we do need help with the fundraiser uh, tomorrow evening and Friday morning. Let me know if you can help with that. Plan to be here. Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock, Christmas Day at 10 a.m., and there's a singing tomorrow night you don't want to miss, 7 o'clock at the Coal, and we have some tickets to give away. Let me know as soon as possible if you'd like one. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.